Anna has come with her chair. I have found my chair. <laughs> We're all good. Chairs, chairs are here. Charity. So, welcome. Um, I'm Cathy Holloway. Uh, you already know me. I'm Anna. I'm a PhD student at GDI Hub. Um, I'm, yeah, well, let's clap. I, I fully... Things are not working. So in interlude, we shall look at Yogi Bear. I find that in all stressful moments, the best thing to do is to look at Yogi Bear. Yogi, come here and say hello. Yogi, what do you know about captioning? Do you know anything about captioning? No, he doesn't know anything about captioning. He is unable to caption. For those of you that um, don't see Yogi, Yogi is a apricot, would we say? Apricot poodle? What would you say? A little browner than apricot. A light, light bay. You can't call my dog a light bay. <laughs> we're good to go. Okay, we can stop talking about Yogi Bear because we're good to go. So, Anna, back over to you. Yeah. So, in this session, we're going to be talking about. Is my mic on? Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about. No, it's not. No. Hang on. We can. We can always pass back and forth. There you go. Try now. Thank you. I'm trying now. Is it working? Yeah, it's on there. Amazing. So in this session, we're going to be talking about, uh, unfortunately, rather frequent failure in the area of disability innovation, um, which is summed up by the concept of disability dongles. Um, and disability dongles was a term coined in 2019 by Liz Jackson to draw attention to the phenomenon of design and engineering students and practitioners creating innovative disability solutions that disabled people don't actually want or have use for. Um, so some things that come to mind that we will in fact talk about are things like stair climbing wheelchairs, are things like exoskeletons. Um, there's an interesting case of some haptic shoes. Um, <laughs> and they're often very well intended um, and often elegant looking, but fairly useless solutions to problems that disabled people didn't know we had, because often <laughs> we, we don't have them. Um, and one of my favorite ways that, that Liz, who, who coined this term, talks about them is that disability dongles are contemporary fairy tales that appeal to the abled imagination by presenting a heroic designer protagonist whose prototype provides a techno-utopian solution to the design problem. So we're going to talk a bit about why this is harmful, some case studies, and what we can do to avoid them. Brilliant. So one of the additional features of a disability dongle is the idea that we might actually create something that disabled people that we want. However, it gets as far as a prototype stage. You win an award. You get lots of accolades. Your LinkedIn profile goes sky high. Everybody wishes to connect with you and then nothing happens. It doesn't come to market. We never get to use the device. We simply get to look at a poster or a 3D print yes. of a device. And that is really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, every, it's not the it's not, sometimes it's not the designer's fault, right? right. They are, they've worked with disabled people. They've done all the hard work of figuring out what we need. How is it going to come? How can they make, fin, fill our need? How, what, what is it they're going to do? And then they go through iterations, lots of iterations, and they finally produce a great design, but they have no one to help them get it to market. So we're not blaming necessarily the designers. We're simply saying that we'd really, really love it if people answered questions that people actually had, and then we got together to bring those solutions that we like to the market. And the reason they're known in the community as disability dongles is because the dongle that you use for your laptop, for instance, is an adapter, and these devices are adaptive, and both are created to often make their subject or their user compatible with a normative system to create that connection. And so we also want to be asking, no matter what we are creating, is are you creating accessibility for someone, or are you trying to make them fit into an existing system? Are we looking at collective, or are we looking at individualized? systems of access because you could get someone up some stairs by building them a thirty thousand dollar stair climbing wheelchair or we could build a ramp which is going to be far cheaper 
and enable access often for far more people. Um, so it's looking at factors like that. And so, shall we go into some examples? We shall. We shall. So I'm going to put my hand up here. I have created disability dongles. <laughs> In my earlier years as a PhD student, I spent a very, very, very long time investigating the biomechanics of wheelchair propulsion. Now, I think I've done my penance. I have been at comedy gigs where I have been picked on, thanks to ex-partners, ex <laughs> who would say, oh, no, she did a PhD in wheelchairs, and everybody knows what a wheelchair is. So, that, so then comedian would say, oh, what's your PhD about? And I would say, well, my PhD is about, because at that time I was very proud of this, how hard it is to push a wheelchair on slopes. <laughs> <laughs> and they would say, it's a chair with wheels. Has it really taken you four years <laughs> to figure that out? And I would say, well, I didn't say the next bit. I, I, I knew I'd lost the battle. But I would have said, well, there's a Stamford model of the shoulder, but I've improved it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I've got a much better model, let me tell you. But eventually, people like Pete that you met today, I got the great pleasure of meeting people like Pete, uh, Pete Donnelly. And the more I met people who were actual wheelchair users, the more I realised nobody cares how much force is going through their shoulder. <laughs> Literally nobody. Maybe, maybe the odd Paralympian, if they thought it was going to improve a fraction of a second. But the average person really couldn't care less. And it was one of the incentives, actually, to, to leave that world behind and, and to come to GDI Hub. So should I pass back to our, our on-screen examples? I don't know if our on-screen... Uh, are our on-screen examples able to come on screen? If not, no, we're not doing on-screen examples. That's fine. That's good. What we had on our first slide for people's reference was a um, headline from a disability satire publication that you should all check out. Oh, it's working. Oh, yes. Can we go back to the first slide? It's really funny. If we could go back to the first slide before we get to exercises and haptic shoes. Amusing and pleasing. I do think that's an Arduino, though. It's a lily pad Arduino, which is a nice bit of kit. Okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Yeah, go for it. Work the squeaky wheel. <laughs> so this is the squeaky wheel. It's an entirely disabled written and run uh, satire publication. And this is one of their headlines, which is, uh, man sol solves problem no disabled person actually has <laughs> with unaffordable invention. <laughs> and the image description for this is it has a tech bro looking dude <laughs> with like a, a board and he's pointing at it and is very proud of his unaffordable invention. <laughs> and there were a lot of these, right? There were, a lot of, there were a lot of unaffordable inventions. Um, we have seen many of them try to come to market um, and fail. But shall we move on to the second one, or do you want to? No, let's move on to the let's second one. Let's move on to the second. I want to hear Kathy talk about exoskeletons. She just wants to mock me further. It's so funny. I'm I, sorry. I can promise you that every, each and every PhD student I've ever had has seems to be in the happiest when mocking me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the second one is an exoskeleton on the right-hand side, I believe. Yes. I'll do my best to image. And if you'll look closely, if you can see it, the man in the exoskeleton is climbing two or three steps, and in the background is a ramp up those two or three steps. <laughs> it's a fantastic photo. So uh, this is where I give a little interlude about my exoskeleton research. <laughs> so many, many years ago, I did do some exoskeleton research. That's where I met Ben Oldfrey, actually. Um, and at the time, it wasn't my grant, but at the time we were tasked with seeing if we could make some soft robotics. Um, so could we make some soft robotics solutions? And there are some, I will say, good applications of exoskeletons. A an example would be if you have a spinal injury between your, your lumbar spine six and seven, you might be able to put your hands out but you're not able to contract them. And that makes it very difficult for you to independently transfer. So it could be quite interesting to make a material that would just allow you to have that one dimensional degree of freedom that would do that. However, we also thought we'd look, exoskeletons had just made it to the market, right? And I was working at the time at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital, which is up at Stanmore, and built a biomechanics lab there. Because as I said, I liked biomechanics at the time. And some, some people, I won't mention the, the company's name, but they came to the NHS and they wanted to trial using an exoskeleton as part of research. Mm -hmm. right? 
And we thought, oh, we have to have a look at this. So, there was, and it was, in fairness, there was always one person. And normally, it's a person who's very recently had a spinal injury and is still would maybe like to walk. All research after two years of any spinal injured patient basically says they couldn't care less about walking. Most spinal injured patients, the primary things they'd like to research is anything to do with going to the toilet and anything to do with having sex. Those things they really care about, walking, not so much, right? But at the time, this exoskeleton company comes along as so we go to see it. It turned out, this wheelchair user, it took 45 minutes for this wheelchair user to get into the exoskeleton. Now, the average NHS appointment for physiotherapy <laughs> is 45 minutes. Right? <laughs> so in your session, you could get into the suit. But we do have, and I haven't shown it, but I'll put it on YouTube later, or on, on Twitter later, Julia Barbareski and I decided we would try and measure the biomechanics of this suit. So we got Julia into the suit, because we couldn't get ethics in time for a wheelchair user to get into the suit. And we have Julia moving incredibly slowly <laughs> on a treadmill. Right? And what we learned was that basically this, the exoskeleton couldn't rehabilitate you. It could move you really slowly, but actually it had no functional ability whatsoever to rehabilitate your muscles. And ridiculously, that is one of my hi most highly cited papers in academia. <laughs> to this day, I cannot get away from exoskeletons. If you go to Google Scholar, I think in the top three papers are the two interludes I had <laughs> in exoskeletons. Because non-disabled people love an exoskeleton. We're not sure why, but they really do. They really do. They really do. And it's, it's not to say that this is inherently bad and no one should be allowed to research or use an exoskeleton if it does become usable, if it does become feasible. But it's worth asking the question, why are so many non-disabled engineers obsessed with researching this, putting money and funding and time into researching this over many of the other things that disabled people are actually asking for? And that would provide a much more holistic cheaper sense of, of access. And the other image on this is a, a haptic shoe. And the haptic shoe was created by a company who noticed that white canes used by blind and visually impaired people um, had not changed very much in 100 years. So that was their problem statement. <laughs> <laughs> and so another thing that we should be thinking about is what is the problem you're trying to solve? <laughs> and, and has a disabled person told you that, that they have that problem? And this isn't to say that white canes are perfect. You know, certainly there are issues with blind and visually impaired people, particularly not being able to, to get a sense of obstacles above where the cane is. But the haptic shoes were not solving this. <laughs> they were just doing the same as the cane, detecting obstacles at a very low level on the ground, but doing it worse uh, you had to charge the shoes. <laughs> Sometimes they, they didn't detect right. They didn't fit everyone. It was a whole thing. And so again, <laughs> a disability dongle. And they were extremely expensive as well. They never went to market. Um, yeah. I think one of the things I, I noted when the, the image was up there, that it's in Arduino lily pad, um, a bit of kit. And, and one of those things is that electronics, uh, how to make things, has become easier. Mm. And as an educator in STEM, in, in science, technology, engineering, and maths, that's brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. It means I can go to any school, pretty much anywhere, and people can afford to make things. I think the downside is that means that everybody and their mothers and their fathers and their grandmothers and their grandfathers now think they can invent things. <laughs> <laughs> and they can invent things, and that's good, right? Because we need, we do need more solutions yeah. to problems. We just need people to ask the right questions first. So and, we on. and yeah, disabled people, to, to reiterate that, there are so many problems to solve <laughs> and we would love help solving them. I have a sweatshirt that I sometimes wear to GDI Hub that just says, Houston, we have so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> so the problems are there. I, I just wish the people who had this knowledge who sometimes are disabled themselves, and we should be having more disabled innovators and designers. But I also don't want to say that those who aren't disabled or who don't have a particular lived experience of disability shouldn't be entering this field. Absolutely, they should, and be jumping on board um, to, to help solve these problems. But just 
you know, chatting with us for <laughs> a bit. A little bit. We're not too scary. Shall we move on to the next slide? Please. Drum roll. Ooh. So now we'll talk about how to avoid some of those problems. And what we have up here are two photos. One is Tacilia, made by Tiggy, who's here somewhere. Um, and Tiggy created a, a really amazing device that I'm going to let you explain. <laughs> it's really technically complex, and I'm a political scientist. <laughs> um, but what Tiggy did that really is important is he went to blind students in low resource contexts and asked them about their experience in education, about the challenges they were having, and went back to them again and again when designing to Celia. And the other image that was up there um, are spikes on the handle of a wheelchair that a lot of disabled people have innovated and designed and used so that strangers stop grabbing onto the handles <laughs> of their chair and trying to push them without consent. So I think they're called like consent spikes. <laughs> uh, so again, solving problems. Solving problems. And I hope Tiggy won't mind me saying that when he first applied for a PhD, I met him in India at the Enable Makeathon, which we ran with the ICRC when we first started GDI Hub. And then he wrote to me and said, I, I really want to apply to UCL for a PhD and would I be a supervisor? And his proposal <laughs> oh, no. was on exoskeletons. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'd met this young man and I thought, he's good. He's really good. It's the wrong problem, but he's really good. Um, so I'll support it. We haven't got time to change it. And it got accepted. The, the UCL funding that he got awarded, the, the, the Commonwealth Fellowship Scholarship that he got, was awarded for that. And I gave him, I think, three months to come back and convince me that anybody who used a wheelchair wanted an exoskeleton. And if, if he could find those people, I'd be really, really happy to support us doing a project on exoskeletons. And after a few months, he came back and went, I've been thinking about changing to visual impairment. <laughs> I've been in schools in India when I was home, and I've realized that it's a real problem. You know, people, because it, it is quite an interesting problem. If you ask people in, young children in India to draw, for example, a tree, they'll often draw a circle. And if you ask them, like, why, why is that a tree? When we've done research with them, the, the one girl was explaining to me that the reason it was a tree is because she always hugged the tree. So she hugged the tree on the way to work. So her perception of a tree was that. And she didn't have an image to, to see a tree. So as far as she was concerned, that's what a tree looked like. And, and of course, it did look like a circle to her. And so Tessilia, the device, was co-designed with hours in schools, trying to understand how do people learn, how do children learn, how does the dynamics of group interactions work, and also how stretched are the teachers which are generally very stretched. And there are new devices, tactile interfaces, that can do this. Um, uh, one company's just got an awful lot of money from Apple t to do a tactile interface. But those devices retail at about $20,000. And the reason they're so expensive is that the way tactile interfaces are generally made is imagine a motor, a small motor, and that generates a little pin being pushed up, goes up. And so now let's say you need a thousand of those, you need 1,000 motors. And in each motor, there are a number of parts. And so the complexity of the design doesn't scale. It gets just as expensive. The, the bigger you go, the more expensive it is. And what Tiggy spent a long time doing, and in his PhD Viva, he had this moment where he realized this eureka moment was a post-it note on his desk. And he then tried to recreate the post-it note in a shape memory alloy, which was night norm and has now got to the stage where he can individually heat these part, these, this is one sheet of metal that has little cuts in it, like post-it notes, and he has a little motor that goes along, or heater that goes along and is able to heat it. He's also invented a little printer using um, the old CD lasers, and the laser, you can give it an image, it will pixelate the image, and it will automatically print you a photograph, a tactile image of, of that device. So it was great. And it did initially come <laughs> from exoskeletons, but, but from that journey of speaking to people and finding out what the real problem was. And Tiggy hasn't stopped there. Now <laughs> You can't stop Tiggy. Yeah, he's thinking about how to actually get this into people's hands. Yeah, so and he won, an event, he won the um, Innovator of the Year Award uh, just Friday. Yes. Friday, um, which is UK. Yeah. So... 
moral of the story be like that be more tiggy be more tiggy <laughs> be more koala i was be really impressed koala. with our friends from koala who are talking about the importance of context um so much of these designs really does depend on on context in a way that some people are not including in in that process and I'll just mention one thing that Tiggy's involved with, but so are our friends at IIT Madras uh, and IIT Delhi. Coming very soon will be an AT Innovation Portal, and in that portal people will be able to see statements from disabled people or persons with disability about what's needed, but they'll also be able to see what's already on the market. Because the other thing is that sometimes people don't realise this solution already exists in a different geography or doesn't realise that there are other people they could be collaborating with in, in another country. So very soon, thank you to UK Aid and the Age 2030 programme and, and to the NCAT uh, in India, we'll be uh, bringing that on live, which will hopefully help to get rid of disability dongles. Yeah. And if that all doesn't convince you, the fact that it's a good thing to do, um, the fact is that disabled people are getting a lot savvier about calling it out. So more and more often when it, it's often larger tech companies who release something not so useful, potentially for brownie points, uh, disabled people are getting more rehearsed and, and better at saying, actually, no, this isn't acceptable. And, and we see what you did and we see that you didn't talk to us. We see that you're advertising it, but not getting it into people's hands, um, and people are getting called out. I think that's something positive, and and you know adds some stick to the carrot and stick equation, uh, which is is good. And with that, I think. Do you want to start closing, Kathy? Yeah, no, I can close. I was going to just see if anybody had any questions or comments yeah. first, as a, if that's okay, if we've got time. It seems to be a Ooh, few hands. <laughs> okay. Oh, and Fernando at the front as well at some point. Yes. Hi, my name is Sheila. Um, I really think it's great that you bring up the concept of contextualization, and maybe this is me throwing it out to the entire population here that is... Uh, working on disability and innovation. In the African space, you find that, and, and this anyone could debate me from a science perspective, but I feel that in spaces like the UK, as soon as you're born or as soon as they know you're going to have a disability, it's almost like there's a level of existing access to AT. In the African space, that doesn't happen. Majority of the time. And you get to interact with assistive technology maybe later as you get older. But I feel on a basis of contextualization, has innovation, because there's all this assistive technology that's coming up and is being sent to Africa, whether on charity or whatever, but to not have assistive technology means that adaptively you physically develop different. But then you're the technology that is coming, the AT that is coming, doesn't factor the fact that adaptively some problems have been solved with a population that doesn't have access to AT. And so you bring a wheelchair or a prosthetic limb that otherwise slows me down because physically I have adapted to the fact that I did not have it. These people have built muscle, more upper body strength because you did not have access to the AT. And then this brings me to the point of contextualization in a sense of does disability innovation factor the fa factor in the context of developing nations as is the Africa space? Because we have had situations whereby you donate this amazing technology and it's completely unrelatable, one. Two, slows down the person and makes them less efficient. And three, amazing chair, if I have any issue where there's a breakdown, the technology is so specific that we have what we call a graveyard of 80. I use it for the short time that you gave me. Thank you very much. And once it's messed up, we throw it in the backyard somewhere. So does 80 contextualize that aspect of it? There's a lot there. Do you want me to start? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. So, so I think with the context, you're absolutely right. Um, vast majority of assistive technology that's designed for one context may or may not work in another context. Some things do. I mean, a white cane works 
mostly, no matter where you, you get off a, you get off a plane. I would argue that Anna's wheelchair would struggle in Kibera, for example. Right? We would we'd probably get a little bit stuck somewhere <laughs> along the along the way. Now, there has been historically a charity-based model, um, and that has been very problematic. It's, it's filled a gap, but it's also been problematic in getting the governments to take responsibility for filling that gap, right? Because it's because you're a government and you've got a lot of different competing priorities and, and that one's sort of being sorted <laughs> by somebody and so how do you come in um, so one of the things we've been trying to do is support local uh, innovators in Kenya in particular uh, we're beginning to, to do some work also in Rwanda and, and in Ghana um, and, and actually in South Africa but trying to support the ventures to scale now I always laughed uh, when we started the Age 2030 program because I thought to myself it's really hard to get assistive technologies to market. And we're now being asked to see what works in doing it in Africa, where it's really hard to get, to get things to market anyway, because you've got, you've got more challenges. We have supported about 48 ventures, and a few of them are beginning to scale now. But one of the biggest challenges has been that user-based design in country, that contextualization, followed by enough evidence and support and that valley of death you know in, in the entrepreneurial world we have this valley of death we've got a great idea people normally back you they give you ten thousand pound prizes you keep going you keep going but you really need probably about half a million to, to begin to scale realistically and so all the ten thousand pounds i keep calling it life support i wish people would cut it off i wish honestly you just make the difficult decision either invest or stop investing right you're just these poor young entrepreneurs are spending five six seven years not actually being given the real opportunities to scale whilst constantly being dangled with the potential to scale which which i think is unfair we along with others are going to launch a, an impact fund soon and, and we hope to trial a num a sm very small number and see how, how we make that, that work. Um, but a second point that you raised was the graveyard of ATs. And I'll just say something small about that before maybe handing over to Anna. Tomorrow, Ben Oldfree will, will lead a session um, which is based mainly with our Nepalese partners on the circular economy of assistive technology. Now, Norway manages to reuse 66% of its assistive technology. In the UK, I can get a wheelchair. I can ring a friend of mine in, in, in the NHS and I can get a wheelchair for free nearly all the time. And the reason for that is because wheelchairs are not reusable within the National Health Service at the moment. And the minute they're returned, the serial number is filed off so that the NHS can't be sued if anybody decides to use it, and they're just put somewhere. I don't know where all the crutches go. <laughs> I really don't know where all the crutches go. I saw a photo on like, Twitter a few months ago of a giant dumpster with NHS crutches in it. Uh, uh, so see, there. Honestly, like we, we could build yeah. skyscrapers with abandoned crutches. Yeah. <laughs> but we are beginning to look in the UK. Mark Miodovnik, who runs the Institute of Making here at UCL East, has a massive repair project. And we've been working with Mark's team, along with Ben and, and ourselves, to begin to think, what's that circular economy approach to assistive technology? Because if millions of people, uh, we're going to need about 6 million devices per year. Are we really going to take a device and every time, each and every time, we're going to ship it around the world and then we're going to throw it into landfill. We're going to fill our oceans uh, fairly soon. But, uh, but tomorrow, you'll, there will be more about that. But it's a fantastic contribution. Thank you very much, Anna. Yeah, to add to that, I think what you're getting at is, is one of the great ironies of, of tech innovation, even past AT, which is that so much of new tech is tested in Africa, because sometimes there are fewer regulations, it can be cheaper, and then it's brought back to the global north, and that's the only place it goes to market, and the only people who get served by it. Um, and so I think with AT, you, you equally have an imbalance where people are, are not getting what they need, and it's not, if they do, it's not suiting that context. Um, and I think that's not something that is, is going to have a silver bullet. It's going to take a lot of uh, systemic changes. Um, a lot of it is probably local acceler accelerators, like we're trying to run um, here at GDI Hub with, with quite a bit of success. Um, but beyond that, I think all of your points are, are correct, and we have a long way to go. Hello, hi. I'm Mara, and I'm a designer. I'm getting into uh, design for inclusivity as interior design, but also as fashion design. And this was super interesting and funny. 
Um, I'm going to maybe do a, a silly question, but I think seeing how many designers don't have this conversation, maybe it's an important one. It's like, uh, how do you think it's best to facilitate this conversation between designers and disabled people, especially because of the diversity of disabilities and the needs are so many that even if you speak to one, two, three, it's not enough to really design with that accessibility and universal. It's universal sounds really big, but yeah. First of all, I'm really glad you're here. Adaptive <laughs> fashion is an area that, you know, has started to take off, but we certainly need a lot more people in, in that area. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe start and then hand it over to Kathy. Um, I think designers who want to work in an area of disability that they might not have lived experience in, it's a difficult task to immerse yourself in that world. Um, it's, it's not easy, but you have to put yourself in those spaces and make connections and build a network that you can then take knowledge from in a way that doesn't feel just extractive um, and in a way that you get a holistic sense for the people you're designing for of, of what they need. Um, there are some young researchers that I'm working with who are looking to user test things that they're building. And a lot of times they come to me and say, hey, do you know any wheelchair users, blind people, whatever, can you give me their emails? I want to have them do an interview with me, participate in this. And I've, I've stopped for the most part saying yes. Because I think you, as someone in this industry, need to build your own network or your work is not going to be good. You can be the best engineer in the world, but if you don't have a network of disabled people who are friends and colleagues, if you don't know where to go to a community group to maybe source participants, that's a symptom of a much bigger problem. So I think you're really starting in the right place of thinking about how to build that network. And it's at places like these, London is a great place to do it. There's so much rich disability community activity. Um, so I'd say start going to those groups and, and building up that network as much as you can. Sadly, I live in Italy where there's no, nothing oh, like that. Well, <laughs> but I come to UK often. <laughs> yeah, every country has some really amazing uh, disability-led organizations. So I would encourage you to find your local one. I'm supposed to be building a global map, but I haven't done Italy yet. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I think that I, there's a lot of questions, and I think Anna's answered that superbly. So um, what I will do, though, is pass on some contacts from um, Italy to you afterwards, if you, if you would like. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. One more. OK. Sorry, Sir Jonathan and Pete, you're going to have to wait. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. I'm Chantal Kanyabutembo, and I'm also a representative of a hub of Epilepsy Alliance Africa, which is a network of people suffering for epilepsy and also a network of neurologists, nurses, and activists who want to resolve the problem of people who have a brain disease. In Africa, we have 10 million suffering for epilepsy. 50% have autism. And you know that the brain is the center system of everything. Majority of the children end up with a severe disability. Example, those with Enoch syndrome, Velvet syndrome, etc. And even most of patients we, we check online because we develop the telemedicine by collaborating with Marrakesh University, Mohamed VI. So we collect many doctors, surgeons, even uh, pediatric, to treat those children online. I've been also inviting, I think you know, one of uh, the lady who, is, she's, she's also a professor, Charlotte Baker, for Disability Inclusion Africa. Through Innovator, we have Brad Mboya, who developed an, an app to prevent the trigger and the fatal in incident for those children. I don't know, because coming here, I saw that you are able to link us to the stakeholders and sort it out that matter. We have a Congress coming up in Marrakesh on 22nd of February to 24. And I saw also the, the European Academy of Neurologists agree to endorse that Congress because they saw the hard work we do 
by saving the coast of Africa, by saving life of those children, because majority end up with spinal, spinal cord uh, damage and they become disabled permanently. We, don't, we know that the problem of the wheelchair throw up by the NHS, sometimes I can get six from people and I ship it for my own saving. But I'm asking you, as people who are trying to help, uh, or institutions who are trying to help patients and prevent disabilities, if you can come up on us, and then we develop the app up, up on the end, because even Bratton Wire through Innovata receive a reward, through Google receive rewards, but we don't have enough fund to finance such good person who pass through epilepsy and end up with a solution for parents to be out of anxieties. Thank you so much. And I think that your project in Rwanda, thank you for coming to my country. I'm from Rwanda. And I like everything the Commonwealth brings to the ground. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was just saying, I know Bright. I've met Bright a, a couple of times, mm -hmm. um, and he's a fantastic innovator, and his, his app is excellent. Mm -hmm. I have no, I have no um, doubt about that. Uh, there are, like Bright, there are a number of excellent innovations globally that are ready for f further investment. Um, it's not, I don't, unfortunately, I don't earn enough money to be able to personally invest <laughs> in Bright or in anybody else. Um, but we are going to set up a fund. We are going to have a call. We are going to try and see whether we can understand what the right mix of things is. Because what Bright needs is, like you said, not only financial capital, he needs network capital, but he also needs a little bit of technical uh, capital in terms of helping him understand how to make uh, the validate basically and, and get the various yeah. validations where, where it would be able to go to market successfully and, and be successfully FDA approved, C marked, etc. So we will, he's on our radar, don't worry. Uh, it's going to be a few so. months. It takes a while to set some things like this up. Um, and, I, and I know sometimes that, that can feel frustrating if you're an innovator because you want to get, get going now, but we have to, we have to set it up rigorously. We have to be able to test it rigorously. And in the meantime, we'll continue to connect people like Bright to anybody I can to, to help him scale. Yeah, we have also the the application AIDS management, which yeah. we, we help also for the 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 diagnostic about epilepsy because we have less physician in Africa yeah. able to close that gap of the treatment, and uh, that app was developed by Dr. Victor Patterson, include also other members of the Epilepsy Alliance Africa. If you know him, maybe from Belfast Universities. We tried that up, and it's an intellectual property, but That's I think that it may help also close the gap on the treatment. If we need I, sponsor... Sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off because we're out of time. But, I'm, I, but after here, we have a break, and I will be delighted to have coffee with you and to hear more. But I think that both of those innovations sound genuinely really fantastic. Sorry. Thank you so much. No, no, thank you. And I'm really sorry to have to cut you off. Final words. Final words. Final words. Go on, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Be better. Be more tiggy. You have an obligation. <laughs> if that's not enough for you, the moral obligation, people will call you out when you do dumb shit. <laughs> um, oh, and I wanted to quote, end with a quote from Neil Marcus, which is one that we say very often in, in the community and in, in activist spaces, and I think is very good for an, an innovation conference. Disability is an art. It's an ingenious way to live. So I'd like for us all to be thinking about disability innovation in that way. Disability is, is much more than just a problem. Think about the problems you are trying to solve um, and listen to disabled people as you are doing it. Thank you very much for your time and for those questions. Thank you. After that super funny session, we just have...